Jerusalem. Um, and hey, I guess we're recording too. So Pastor John, if you see us, want to say hi. If you're in Korea or Denver, we love you. <laughs> <laughs> so this morning, um, my name is Ty. I'll be teaching you. I'm, I'm, I've been our youth pastor here for a while. Most of you guys know me here. If not, um, well, welcome. We want to say welcome to Journey Church. And there was um, a number of years ago, I used to pastor a small church on the Big Island. It was a New Hope Church. And at that church, um, Laura and I were there, and we, there was this Christmas party we went to. And if you know me, one of the things you'll know about me is I, I tell a lot of stories, and sometimes they're true, and sometimes they're not. And, I, and that's part of my humor. That's just kind of, um, I'll make up stuff just because it's, it's kind of fun for me. And um, we were at this, Laura and I were at this Christmas dinner with all the pastors for the Big Island churches. And we're there with our district supervisor, which means my boss and my boss's boss. His name is Wayne Cordero was over there. And, um, and I'm sitting next to Laura and I, I said some stupid comment, which I always do. And um, I, I, don't, I don't even remember what I said and then Laura turns to Pastor Wayne, who's my boss's boss, and I, I'm a new pastor there, and she says to Pastor Wayne, she says, Pastor Wayne, my husband just made up a story and he lied. Do pastors make up stories and lie? And I thought, oh, no, I'm going to get kicked out of the church. I'm going to get excommunicated. I'm going to get fired from the ministry, and I better call Pastor John, see if he can take me at Journey Church. But... <laughs> <laughs> Again, some of what I say is true, some of what I say is not true. So, um, so Pastor Wayne <laughs> looks at her, and, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm in for it now. And Pastor Wayne gives her this big smile, and he says, they lie and tell stories all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so pastors, we, if we catch a fish that's this big, we're going to tell you it's this big. <laughs> now, so some of what I say will be true, and some of, some of what I say is maybe embellished a little bit. And I'll let you know what it is, because... If I just make up stories, then that's just lying, and we don't want to lie here in church, right? So I'm going to tell you a story that some of it is true, some of it maybe not so much, and I'll tell you what it is. But anyway, um, it was a few years ago, I went jogging. Now that's true. I actually like to go jogging. I went jogging, and I was running, um, I went down to the, the school where my son is, my son's now in high school there, but I was at the school, I was running, exercising, I like to run, which, which also is true like to run, and um, I was jogging, and you know, as you get older, there's something that I learned, is that there are times that in your mind, you think your body can do certain things, but the body says, no, you, you can't really do it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah? Good. I, I'm, I'm glad I'm not the only one here. So there, I'm running, and I think I'm running good, but then this old man jogs past me, and he's got to be like 120 years old. And he probably wasn't really 120 years old, but this is my story, so I'm telling you. But he's probably 120 years old, and he runs past me. Now, Laura will testify to you that there is a competitive edge in me sometimes that comes out. Now, I can't stand when I'm running, and a 120-year-old man runs <coughs> past me. Now, I understand that sometimes the body can't do what the mind thinks it can do, but nobody told that 120-year-old man that. He's just running, going for broke, and so I get upset. And here's what I start doing. I look at him charging ahead, and I think, I'm not going to let that 121-year-old man run past me. So I start picking up the pace. I run, and I know you breathe in through the nose, out through the mouth, in through the nose, out through the mouth, and then eventually it's out through the mouth, in through the mouth, out through the mouth, and I'm running, and I'm trying to catch up with that 120-year-old guy, and he keeps going, and he keeps getting farther and smaller, until I finally gave up, gave up, gave up. What kind of pastor says that? Well, I finally gave up, and I started walking, and I got so frustrated, and I'm like, Lord, I just got, out, got outrun by a 120-year-old guy, and he was probably jogging since he got off of Noah's Ark. <laughs> And he outran me. What is wrong with me, Lord? And the Lord kind of stirs something on me. He kind of says, Ty, here's the thing. You try hard. And I do. I tried hard. He says, but he trains. Ty, you put on your shoes and you run every now and then when you feel like it. But that guy trains and he runs even if he doesn't feel like it. He gets up and he runs. That's why he can outrun you at 120 years old. Now, God didn't really say he's 120 years old. 
And that's something the Lord showed me is that sometimes there's a difference between trying hard and training. And so I, I finished my run. I got to where I parked the car. And, and wouldn't you know, there was that 120-year-old guy over there. And I got up to him. And I looked at him and said, I know you. How's it going, Pastor John? <laughs> okay, that's not really true. I, I just thought it would be kind of funny. <laughs> that, I, just, that, I just thought it would be kind of funny. And, uh, and, and now, um, now it's on recording, so... <laughs> Hi, Pastor John, we love you. <laughs> so the jogging was true. The guy may not have been 120. He might have been only 105. But the point is that sometimes we think we have to try hard when God says we need to train instead. And I think, um, I mean, our, our folks, we, we got some folks here who are in the armed service, who are in the military, and there's a difference between trying hard and training. Because when somebody's deployed on a mission, going out to war, they don't just put on a service uniform and try hard. They actually train. They give their lives, right? You guys give your lives to training and preparing so that when you're deployed, you're ready. You know what to do. You don't just put on the outfit and then go and try hard. You train. And, and there's a big difference. Big difference. There's a Coach Vince Lombardi. Anybody heard of him? Yeah? Who's he a coach for? Green Bay Packers. That's my brother Rich over there. Welcome, Rich. Um, Green Bay Packers. He's the coach for the Green Bay Packers, and he was known for his, his commitment to the fundamentals. Just know the basics. Guys on the NFL who at the top-notch level of football, he would teach them how to pass, how to catch, how to tackle. Now, I, I got to say this, and um, I, I may be uh, stoned and excommunicated from this church, is I am one of the few brothers here who's not a big football fan. Everybody say, oh, oh, yeah. And here's why I'm not a big football fan, because I, I like those sports where there's always a chance that anybody can win. So maybe I watch mixed martial arts or boxing or something, because at any point, somebody else can win. And by halftime, I think for most football games, you kind of know who's going to win already. Like, for example, this past year's Super Bowl. Laura and I and the kids were watching the Super Bowl, and by halftime, score is 21-3. Who's winning? Atlanta, Atlanta is winning 21-3. I told Laura, this game is over. This is why I don't like football. It kind of stinks because I already know who's going to win. So we jumped in the car, went to her cousin's house, and we arrived at her cousin's house, and her cousin comes out and says, hey, did you know the Patriots won? I was like, you're kidding me because if that really happened, then we just missed the greatest come back in all of Super Bowl history because I thought the game was over too early. And guys, I missed the greatest comeback in all of Super Bowl <laughs> history. So why am I telling you guys that? I don't, I don't know. That has, you know what that has to do with the message? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely <laughs> nothing. But here's the thing is that we're trying versus training. And Vince Lombardi was a guy that knew the importance of the fundamentals. And there's said a story that there's once the Green Bay Packers lost to a team that they should have won. And on the next day, coach got all his team together and they're all standing with their heads down. And coach walked down the line and he looked them straight in the eye. And he eyed up his team. And he picked up a football and he said, gentlemen, this is a football, and we're going back to the fundamentals, and we're going back to the basics. So I want to challenge you this morning. We're, what we're going to do is the message we're talking about this morning is called Starting Fresh. We're going, we're going to go back to the basics. We just finished up with Pastor John's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which to me was a great series. And today, we're starting fresh. We're going to come back to some basics. And um, it was a few years ago that a pastor friend of mine said, Ty, if you could sit down with a new believer and all you had was three weeks, three, maybe 45-minute sessions to pour into somebody's life and that person's got to be a disciple from then on, what would you say? What would you do? How would you invest in them? And that took me on a journey for about two years to write this book called Starting Fresh, Following Jesus on the Adventure of a Lifetime, which I wrote for that very purpose is that if... I only had three weeks. There's only three parts to this book on how to follow Jesus on the adventure of a lifetime. How do you start fresh? That's what we're going to talk about this morning. So you get to kind of get the best parts of what I'd written there. Um, but before we jump into oh, there's a part of the cover. Isn't that cool? Let's pray. 
Lord Jesus, we invite you here today. Help us to seek you, to know you. Lord, we're coming back to basics, coming back to fundamentals. Maybe we've walked with you for a long time. Maybe we haven't. But Lord Jesus, would you reveal to us the three most important things of starting fresh so that we can follow you on the adventure of a lifetime. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, we pray and we all say, Amen. Amen. All right. So here's three things. If you have notes, do you guys all have your notes yet? You have notes? All right. If you have your notes, um, we're good. If not, well, I think Jim's going to get some notes for you guys. Um, if you get your notes, then you should have a pen today because I got some blanks for you to fill in. If you don't have a pen, then look at your neighbor, see if they got a pen, and then ask, can I borrow your pen as we're going through the message too? But um, here's, here's the first thing we want to know. If you're going to follow Jesus on the adventure of a lifetime, the first thing, here's the first thing I would point out for you if you're going to follow Jesus. Well, the first thing you got to do is, the first thing is you got to know Jesus. Know Jesus. Now, it's not hard blanks to fill out. Know Jesus or knowing Jesus. Matthew 4.19. We're good, guys. We got our notes. I want to make sure you got your first point. Two words, know Jesus or knowing Jesus. The scripture says, come, this is Jesus saying, come follow me and I'll send you out to fish for people. How many of you in here are married? Raise your hand, raise your hand. Yeah, good. Now, there's, when you're married, there, you know there's um, some things in life that are so important that you can't have anybody else or anything else do it for you. Some things you have to do for yourself. Now that there's social media, you know, there's so many ways to communicate with folks, but I, I just want you to imagine with me for a moment. Laura's my wife over there, and, uh, you know, when we're dating... Um, if I wanted to propose to her and invite her to spend the rest of her life with me, have children with me, um, grow old together with me, and I said, hey, I think I want to propose to Laura, so you know how I'm going to do it, is I'm going to post it on Twitter, and then she'll get my Twitter feed, and then um, maybe she'll marry me. How many of you think she would marry me if I posted my proposal on Twitter? My, my friend Rich has his mouth open, he's like, is that how you do it? No, that's not how you do it. And I, I'd suggest that if that's how I did it, I might still be single today. <laughs> but what if I wanted to make it more personal, so I text message her. Laura, would you marry me? Just, and, and I even put an emoji. <laughs> Good? No. It's, it, there's some things you've got to do yourself. What about if I did a Facebook instant messenger and sent to Laura, hey, would you consider marrying me? No, probably not. I know. Since we need a personal touch, my mom is here too, by the way. So since I need a personal touch to actually invite Laura to marry me, I'm going to say, hey, mom, would you tell Laura how much I love her and tell her that, ask her if she wants to marry me? Mom, would you do that for me? How many of you guys think I'd be married today? No. Why not? Because there are some things that are so personal, so important that I got to do it myself. I have to go and get on one knee and propose to my wife myself. Otherwise, I'm staying single forever. You guys tracking with me? Now, why do I say that? It's because part of knowing Jesus is understanding that God saw you as so important that He said, I'm going to come myself in the form of Jesus Christ. I'm going to invite you into a relationship with me. Jesus is God incarnate coming to earth because he says there's something so important I can't, I'm not going to send a prophet to tell you about. I'm not going to send an angel to tell you about. I'm not going to send even a pastor or teacher or apostle or prophet or evangelist. I'm going to come myself to proclaim my love for you and invite you into a relationship with me. And then when Jesus ascends, I'm going to give the Holy Spirit to be with you all the time. So Jesus comes in the, person, in the form of a human to invite us into a relationship with God. That's what knowing Jesus is about. That's what the gospel is about. How many of you heard the term gospel before? What do, what do you think of when you hear the term gospel? What does that mean? Good news. Some, some of you guys said good news. So Jim said good news. Now, if, if the Broncos win their next game, is that good news? Yes. Yes. <laughs> is that the gospel? Hmm, maybe it could be. No, it's not the gospel. It's not the gospel. The gospel is good news, 
but it's not just any good news. I'll tell you what it means in the context of the culture because gospel was not a religious term back in Jesus' day. The gospel was the good news specifically that the king was victorious. Because back in their day, kings and their armies would go out to battle and there'd be people in the towns working. And here's what they couldn't do. The people in the towns working, they couldn't check their Twitter feed to see, oh, the battle's done. Oh, Facebook, okay, now we won the war. They didn't know. So when the kings were at war and the king won the battle, they'd send gospel carriers out to the different towns. And the gospel carrier would arrive at a town and he'd gather everyone together and say, hey, guys, guys, everybody come together. Here's what happened. The battle is over. The king has won. You're safe now that you know the good news that the king has won and that you're safe. Live in light of that. Now, the people could then take the gospel, the good news, and say, oh, the king's won. We're safe. Uh, I'm still going to live in fear. I'm going to still live in shame. They could do that. But they're invited to respond to the good news that the king is victorious. Now, what is the gospel that we know is that we come, people like myself or Pastor John, we come and we'll be gospel carriers that tell you the king is victorious. Jesus Christ is victorious over sin and death and despair and depression and hardship. The king is victorious. Now, you get to go live in light of that. Isn't that cool? That's what the gospel is about. The gospel is knowing that the king is victorious. Now live in light of that. Who's invited to know the gospel? Someone with a sexual past? Yeah, the gospel's for you. Someone with same-sex attractions? Yeah, the gospel's for you. It's for everyone. If it's for someone who has too much religious pride, the gospel's for everyone. If it's someone who carries too much shame, the gospel is for everyone. If, someone is, if it's for someone who gossips too much, the gospel is for everyone. If it's for Republicans, the gospel is for everyone. If it's for Democrats, the gospel is for everyone. If you like heavy metal music, the gospel is for everyone. If you like country music, the gospel only goes so far. <laughs> okay, some of what I say is true, some of what I say is not. Okay, if you like country music, the gospel is still for you. The gospel is for everyone. If you think you're too young, the gospel is for you. If you think you're too old, the gospel is for you. It's for everyone. Knowing that the king is victorious. Isn't this good stuff? Now, if you have Bibles, you can turn to Genesis chapter 2. We're going to have the scriptures come up on the screen in a little bit. Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to give you a little bit of a Bible study. And I think you'll like this because when, when I, I discovered this, I'm like, wow, that's kind of cool. One of those things that I read in the scriptures that i never seen before. And maybe you've never seen this before too. Or if you did, then wow, I'm impressed. But here's, here's what it is. When, as you're turning to Genesis chapter 2, I've shared this before with you at Journey Church here, is that when you read the Bible, watch for things repeated because God repeats things to emphasize importance. Back when they wrote the scriptures, they couldn't boldface or highlight or put in italics the stuff that they wrote. So what they do is they repeat things to emphasize importance. And if you're a parent, you know this because you're going to tell your kids, take a bath before we leave for church. Now remember, I said take a bath before we leave for church. Now, did you take a bath yet? Because we're leaving for church pretty soon. And I just want to make sure that you took a bath before we leave for church. And what you're doing is you're saying, that's important. Is tracking with me? Parents, that's what we do, right? So here's, here's what I want you to watch. And I actually even gave you a little bit of a cheat there. We're going to read some verses in Genesis chapter 2, starting at verse 4. And watch for what's repeated and I'll give you a hint. It's actually underlined on the screen. Okay. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they're created, when the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. Now, no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no, no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathe into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. Now, the Lord God planted a garden in the east, in Eden. And there he put man that he, that he formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground. You guys see a common pattern showing up? What is the scripture saying again and again and again? He's saying the Lord God. Now, if you go through the whole chapter, I think I counted how many times I see the Lord God come up and I think it was about 11 times if the Bible says something once, it's important. 
If it says something twice, it's really important. If it says something three, four, five, eleven times, really, really important. Now, why is this, why is this so important? Because God speaks of who He is. Lord speaks of the position He has in your life. Okay? Now watch this. In Genesis chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3, the enemy, the devil, comes into the picture and he speaks. He's going to speak to Eve. And here's what happens in Genesis chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God, there's Lord God again, had made. And now the devil said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And if you continue on and you look at what the devil says about God, the devil acknowledges him as God. He acknowledges the position of who God is, but he doesn't acknowledge the position. Did God really say that? And here's why I share this with you is because the devil doesn't mind if you say, I believe in God, but the devil doesn't want you to say that he's the Lord my God. He's the one I surrender my life to. He's the one I surrender my heart to. The devil doesn't mind if you acknowledge God, but he doesn't want you to acknowledge the Lord God. Is Jesus not just God? Is Jesus the Lord God of your life? Are you following Jesus? Are you in the Word? Are you in prayer? Is Jesus the Lord God of your life? Is that good? Okay, so first thing, know Jesus, and the second is experience community experience community. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25 says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up on meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day day of the Lord approaching. Sometimes I talk to folks and they say, man, I wonder what it'd be like to be in the early church, in the Acts chapter 2 church or the you know, early Bible church. And I tell you what, if you want to have a picture of what it was like to be in the early Acts chapter 2 church, then you've got to be in a church where people stop coming sometimes. Is that a problem we face today? Sometimes people come to church, sometimes they don't. Maybe they're here, maybe they're not. That's a problem that was 2,000 years ago too. That's an early church problem that's still here. Some people were forsaking or giving up the assembling together of the church as was habit of some. Now, another term I want to tell you, um, I should have put this in the slides, but I didn't. But the original Greek term for church was called ekklesia. If you want to write it down, it's E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A, ekklesia. That was the Greek term for church. Because if you were to tell Peter or Paul or John or Andrew, the early apostles, hey, I go to church at Journey. I come to the Island Pacific Academy and we we go to church there. You know what they're going to do? Is They're going to look at you like this. What? They didn't understand church to be a place you go to worship. They understood church as ecclesia, which, was, which meant called out ones. So let's say this is an army right here. You guys are all an army, and there's a war going to go on. Now, I came, I'm a general, and I say, okay, you, you, the two of you, you and you, you guys come with me. You guys are called out. You're the ecclesia. We're going to go to battle. You guys are called out from everyone else and ready to go to battle. That's what the church was. It was a group of people who were called out apart from everybody else for a specific mission and a specific purpose. So here's what I'd encourage you. If, if, you've, if you're following Jesus, come to a, you come to Journey Church, experience community, be part of the group that's called out to serve God and to follow Him. Find the church that places a high priority on the Bible as the Word of God, that teaches Jesus Christ not only as a son of God, but also that he is God, a church that has a passion for reaching people for Jesus. It's a corporate place of worship and prayer, looks after its members, and where you can use your gifts to serve God as well. That's what a church is, a group of people called out. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I, I've had this conversation a lot of times. People ask, can I be a Christian and not go to church? And the answer to that is yes. But here's the thing I'd suggest. Can you be a growing Christian and not be a part of the church? That, I'd say, no. 
because God calls us out together to be a group of people called out to follow him together. And part of being a part of a community is realizing that we're not a perfect group of people. How many of you are perfect? If you raise your hand, I want to welcome you, Jesus, to this church today, <laughs> right? None of us are perfect. We're not a perfect church. And it's going to be tough if you want to look for the perfect church because it isn't there. And if it is there, once you arrive, it's no longer the perfect church. <laughs> We're called out together to be on mission for Christ and to experience community. That's why Journey Church does small groups. We call them mini church where we get together, we share food, we talk stories, we share life together, we laugh together. If you're not part of a mini church or a small group, I'd suggest get connected. Part of the benefit of being called out together, the called out ones is connecting and experiencing community because you see, when you, whether you realize it or not, your life is God's gift to you, but how you use your life and whom you serve, that's your gift to God. How is your gift to God? Is it good or not so much? So first, know Jesus. Second, experience community. And third, make a difference. Make a difference. I want to ask you, if there's one word that describes you, what would it be? And I, I'm going to challenge you on this because I, I asked, I asked the, the guys upstairs earlier, if you can help me out now, I'm going to give you a name and see what one word you can identify that ties in with this name, all right? See if you can help me out. If not, then you can just leave me up here awkwardly looking at you. But let, let's see if we can figure out these. What word do you identify with the name LeBron James? Basketball. Basketball, okay? Not too difficult, right? How about Steve Jobs? Apple. Apple. What about um, George Lucas? Star Wars. Star Wars. You guys are getting good at this. You see, there's one thing, one thing that you tie these guys' names to. Now, I want to challenge you on this. If you're a parent, what's one thing that your kids tie your name to? Is it too busy? Is it, mine might be Facebook. Is it too distant? What is that one thing that is identified with your name? Because you know what? There will come a day when all of us are said and done and we are dead and buried and our families get together and they eat Ige's food at the mortuary and they talk of stories about us. But when they tell stories, what are they going to talk about? What's that one thing that your life was about? What's that one area you made a difference in? Because that's what really counts when life is all said and done. Jesus said, here's our scripture there, all authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you to the end of the age. Sometimes we think of mission as uh, sending people over the seas to go and share the gospel with people, say, oh, we've got a mission trip. Um, I think next month, some folks from Journey Church are heading over to where are we going to? Ireland, right? Some folks going to Ireland. Um, you know, we talked about some mission work, maybe to Thailand. And we think missionaries are the people who go over the seas and tell people about Jesus. But, but here's the thing. Who goes across the street? God sometimes put us on mission to just walk across the street or even to minister to our own kids or to minister to your coworkers. Wow. Oh. Am I a missionary? Yes, you are. Because who does this scripture talk to? All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore, go. Therefore, if you're a pastor, go and make disciples, right? That's what it says? Therefore, if you're a missionary, go and make disciples of all nations. Is that what it says? No, it, there's nothing there. It says, therefore, go, make disciples. All of us are called to be missionaries and to make a difference in the community where we are at. There's a Christian evangelist named Dr. Wilbur Chapman who did a study in the New Testament. He said, in the New Testament, there are 40 people that Jesus directly healed and touched and changed. And out of the 40, 34 of them were brought to Jesus by friends or family members and had someone bring them to Jesus. And that means only six found Jesus on their own. Now, I wonder how many times we think, well, we're just going to wait for our friends or family to find Jesus on their own but how many of those, how many people 
need to be invited or urged along in order or brought by a friend or brought by family to come to know Jesus. To invite, come see the Jesus who's forgiven my sins because he can forgive yours too. Come see the Jesus who redeemed me because he can redeem you too. Come see the Jesus I follow because he wants you to follow him too. Um, I want to share with you guys this, mm, this last ex- this illustration that um, speaks to me and moves me every time I share it. It's from a movie that um, I seen a few years ago. And I don't rec- if you want to watch it with your family, I, I really don't recommend you watch it with your kids. It's called Schindler's List. Anybody ever heard of that? Yeah? Because if you haven't, I'm going to spoil the movie for you this morning. I'm sorry about that. You can forgive me later because Uncle Jim said forgiveness is really important. <laughs> so forgive me for spoiling the movie. But here's what Schindler's List is about. Oscar Schindler, who's not really a saint of a guy. He's a, he's a um, factory worker. He's actually a, in charge of a factory. But he sees uh, in Nazi Germany how cruel the Nazis were to the Jewish people and how they just killed them like cockroaches. Cared nothing for humanity. Now Schindler thought, well, I see these, this pain and this suffering, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to buy, I'm going to bargain with these Nazis, and I'm going to buy some of these Jewish people to come and work for me. Now some of it didn't make sense because the Nazis knew that if you're going to buy somebody, you buy the best workers, the biggest, strongest guys. You don't buy women or children or old people, but Schindler did. He bought some young people, he bought some of the older folks, some of the women, and he invested. He bought people. And now, at the end of the movie, again, here's a spoiler. And Uncle Jim said, you have to forgive me if I share this with you. But at the end of the movie, Oscar Schindler is standing there with, a, with one of the Jewish guys who's become a friend of his. And lined up is 1,100 Jewish people. And they clap. And Oscar Schindler is standing there. And he looks kind of stoically, he doesn't say much. And his friend, his friend who's closest to him says, Oscar, you, you, you don't understand. This is, this is for you. We're all here because of you. Because you saved us. You bought us. Oscar Schindler and says to his friend, he says, no, you, you don't understand. I could have done more. His friend says, no, 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 you don't, 1,100 of us are here because you gave everything for us. Schindler says, no, you don't understand. I could have done more. You see my car over there? If I sold my car, I could have bought 10 more people. I have a gold pin. If I sold this gold pin, I I could have got two, maybe even one more person. I, I I could have given more. Now, why do I get emotional? Because that is such a powerful story on saving people from the Nazis, but I want to suggest to you, Journey Church, that we are given a more pressing call between heaven and hell, which is eternity. And one day, we might be standing with Jesus up front with 1,100 people lining the rows. You gave at Journey Church... you and I wonder I wonder if we will get to the place and we'll say I could have done more now I I don't think that there'll be mourning in heaven I don't know that we'll be really depressed in heaven but I wonder I wonder if we'll get there and we'll look in in that large crowd of people and think where's my neighbor where's my co-worker where's my brother I could have done more. I could have given more. I could have made more of a difference. I wonder if that'll be you. I wonder, what if, what if we here at Journey Church, see, Jesus turned the world upside down with 12 people, changed the whole face of planet Earth. Do you know there's more than 12 of us here today? I wonder what would happen if all of us were to live our life on mission for Jesus Christ and keep that mentality that I can do something great for the kingdom of God. Now, I might not preach to the masses, but I might be able to give. I might be able to be a part of a small group. I might be able to encourage a coworker, encourage a friend, encourage my kids. How's your faith? I, I wrote that on your notes there. 
Three ways to make a difference. And I won't give you the answers for that. I'll challenge you to think through it. What are three ways you can make a difference? It might be with Journey Church here. It might be outside of our church. What are three ways you can make a difference? And then who are maybe four people you can pray for? Because sometimes it'll be us investing, but it's sometimes maybe just even praying for someone. How can you make a difference? Mm. Now, back in, um, back in Jesus' day, there was something that amazed Jesus, all right? And it wasn't uh, what you might think it is. If you look through the scriptures, there's nowhere in the scripture that Jesus, it says, Jesus saw Matthew's washboard abs and was so impressed. <laughs> no. What do you think impressed Jesus? Maybe Jesus looked at somebody and said, Mary, she's got such a beautiful singing voice. And Jesus was impressed. No, it doesn't say that. Well, Luke, Luke graduated from Harvard, so Jesus was really impressed with that. It doesn't say that. What is it that impressed Jesus? Here's what impressed Jesus. Is there's in Matthew chapter 8, verse 26, Jesus talks to the disciples and he says, Oh, you of little faith. But then here's what impressed Jesus is Matthew 8, 10 says, Jesus says, man, I have not found such great faith, not even in all of Israel. How's your faith? How's your faith? And, and that's what I want to leave you with today um, at, as we are getting ready to wrap on up. And I'm going to invite maybe our worship teams to start coming up. Uh, how's your faith? How can you make a difference in your world around you? You might, you might not be a preacher like Billy Graham, but how can you encourage the kids in your life or maybe the coworkers or family members how can you make a difference so that one day when you're standing in front of 1,100 people, you, you can hear Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. How many of you want to hear that? I want to hear that. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heads bowed and with eyes closed. Hmm. Um, I know a lot of us are here that have been part of the church for a long time, but I want to challenge you. And these three things. Do you know Jesus? Are you sure you know Jesus as not just God, but as the Lord God of your life? Have you surrendered your heart to Him? Have you given your life to Jesus? Do you know Him? Now, if you're not sure, or you haven't given your heart to Jesus, I'll give you an opportunity in a little bit. But that's the first thing I'd say. Do you know Jesus? And the next thing is, do you experience community? If you're part of Journey Church or you're visiting, do you, have you got connected with community here in your church or if you're visiting even from another church, do you experience community? And then the last thing, are you making a difference? Or how are you making a difference? We'll all give our lives to something. We'll all lay down our lives somehow. What about you? Are you making a difference. How's your faith? I want you to consider that, but if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to say a prayer with me, and um, you can say it from your heart. Just, just call out to God. There's not a magic prayer, but I want you to invite. You can say this prayer with me in your heart. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you that you came to give your life in my place, to call me to follow you be a part of your church. Thank you that you laid down your life and now I give you mine. Forgive me of my sins, Lord. Make me brand new. Transform me in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Now with head still bowed and eyes still closed, if you prayed that prayer and you weren't too sure and you're committing your life to Jesus Christ and you're knowing him today, would you raise a hand to say, yeah, that's me. That's me. Head still bowed, eyes closed. If you prayed to receive Jesus today, okay? No. Now, if head still bowed and eyes closed, maybe you're stirred to experience community or to make a difference. I'd like to pray for you, Lord. Um, thank you that you've called us all out to be a part of a church, to be a part of a community, and Father, to make a difference. So I, I pray for a supernatural empowering, a stirring in our hearts that we might make a difference in the community around us, Lord. 
whether it be our friends, our family members, our coworkers, our classmates. Lord, stir us, change us, make us brand new in the precious name of Jesus Christ. And we all say, Amen. Amen. Now, I'm going to invite you guys to stand with me. And I want you to consider as we continue in a time of worship,